Well, good evening. And welcome. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're going to continue our study. We find ourselves in chapter 12. This evening, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. In a passage, in a section that I'm entitling, The Believer's Race. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. You know, sometimes as we make our way through a book, we somehow manage to disconnect from the theme of the book. And the theme of this book is the priesthood of Jesus. And you may not have grown up in a religious tradition where they had priests or temples or rituals. But some of you may have. And you look to priests and temples and rituals to provide a right relationship with God. But the writer of Hebrews wants to make it abundantly clear that the basis of a right relationship with God is in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love, your kindness, your goodness, and your mercy. Lord, in a world that is so uncertain, it is wonderful to have something secure, stable, everlasting, Lord, because we live in a world that is broken and uncertain, we wonder if there's anything that can be solid, consistent, and real. And Lord, we are so grateful for Jesus, for his love, for his mercy and forgiveness, that Lord, as we Many of us have begun our race and some of us continue our race and even some of us will find ourselves towards the end of the race. Lord, we pray that we would be found in Jesus. We commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The writer says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of people who were tempted to return to what they perceived was the purity of Judaism. The reception of the law of Moses, the giving of a temple... And the outline for sacrifice. And the Hebrews who identified with Jesus and who found themselves identifying with Jesus began to experience pressure and increasing temptation and ever increasing persecution. And they were tempted to abandon the Lord Jesus. And the writer encourages the believer in Jesus to endure, to persevere in suffering, to stand against temptation. And for those who 
would find themselves tempted to abandon the Lord Jesus and the gospel of Jesus and the grace of Jesus to understand that there isn't another way. The godly life in Christ includes perseverance and faithfulness and discipline. And so Paul, like, or Paul, the writer of Hebrews, likens it to a spiritual race. But we also have a role model, Jesus. We suffer, but our suffering cannot even for a moment's notice be compared to the suffering of Jesus. We're in a race and our finish line is heaven. We're in a race for abundant life. We're in a race now. We're in a race that's marked by pain. We're in a race that sometimes we experience suffering. We are in a race that will ultimately lead to glory. Our starting line is Jesus. The finishing line is heaven. And so the writer of Hebrews paints a picture and he takes the reader and places him and her in a stadium surrounded by the cheers of the saints in verse one. But he's quick to remind us that there's a struggle and he asks us to abandon everything that would cause us or hinder us or limit us in running the race at the end of verse one. The writer includes a strategy for that race in verses two and three. We want to win our incentive is to win because we are in Christ. Our incentive is Jesus. We look away from all of those things that might fill our hearts with discouragement, dis depression, distraction, the things that might defeat us. And then we look to Jesus and then we resist sin. And so he says, we are in a spiritual race. In verse 1, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The therefore, you already know what it's there for. He is summing up all that he has said. The writer of Hebrews has given several exhortations. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away, he said in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. We were exhorted to hold fast, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. That means we hold on, we squeeze tight, and then we grip with all of our might those things that have been given to us in Christ. We are exhorted to hear in chapter 3, verse 7, and again in verse 15, in chapter 4, verse 7, to hear his voice. And whenever the Bible says, hear his voice, hear the voice of the Lord. The implication is you're not just listening, but you're listening with a view towards obeying. Every mother who has ever said to every child, are you listening to me? There's this expectation. You don't want simply for your child to hear your voice. You want them to respond to that voice, obey that voice. And so the writer of Hebrews says, take heed in chapter 3, verse 12. That is, take heed to watch your heart or it will harden. Cultivate godliness. Allow the spirit of God and the word of God to wash you and mold you and soften your heart to make it pliable to the things of God so that you'll respond to God. The exhortation is to fear in chapter 4 verse 1. A godly fear is a stimulus to faith, an incentive to love, a prevention of failure. We're exhorted to hold fast without wavering in chapter 10 verse 23. We're to 
provoke each other in chapter 10, verse 24. That is, we're to provoke each other to love and to in labor to enjoy his favor, not forsaking, it says, the assembling of ourselves together in chapter 10, verse 25. Because we have a short memory, because we have such a short memory, there's a call to remembrance in chapter 10, verse 32. Because the writer knows that a short memory can often result in a long loss. Because you've already forgotten. And that we're not to throw away our confidence. That we're to have an anchor in the storm. We're not to drift away. We're to believe in chapter 10 verse 39. Lay aside chapter 12 verse 1. All the weights, the heavy objects that weigh us down, every encumbrance. And so he says, let us run with patience so that we can be rewarded with endurance. And in chapter 12, verse 1, when it says, therefore, we are also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. The NIV translates that, well, let me tell you what, what it says. The weight is an interesting word. It's agos. It means something that is a weight or a burden. It became an, a metaphor for an encumbrance. And so the NIV spells it out by saying, Everything that hinders. It prompts the question. What's slowing you down? What's slowing you down? What's making it difficult for you to continue? To run? What's slowing you down? What's breaking your stride? What's keeping you from moving forward? It says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. It's all one word in the original language. It's a long Greek word, euperistastos. It only appears one time in the entire Greek New Testament, and it's right here. And it's one big long word, which means readily encircling, or besetting, or entangling. Marcus Dodd says, that which characterizes all sin, it's the tenacity which it clings to a human being. And so... It is the sin which clings to us. And so he's, he's basically saying, what is it that's going to keep you from running the race with endurance and encouragement? And the idea being, since you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, and, the, and, the, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, the cloud of witnesses, I think, are everyone that he mentions in chapter 11, but I think it's probably something way more even than that. It's a group of people who are watching to see whether or not how you're going to do in the race. The child of God has to always remember two things. You have a loving savior, a wise shepherd who keeps you, but you also have a wily enemy, the devil, who seeks to ensnare you. So we're what? We're warned to watch out for the snare of the devil in 1 Timothy 3. We're what ensnared the devil serves as a warning for us. Lucifer was overcome with pride, becomes Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28. If you do a little Bible study and you look up all of the places in the Bible where that word snare or ensnare occurs, it talks about the snare of the devil, the snare of pride, the snare of riches. It says that the rich will fall into temptation and a snare in verse, first Timothy. There's the snare of sleeplessness, awake themselves out of the snare of the devil, second Timothy two. There's the snare of idolatry. Gideon made an ephod, which thing became a snare, it says to Gideon in his house in Judges chapter eight. The idea being, Anything that trips you up, anything that holds you back, anything that serves as a substitute 
to keep you from going forward. There's the snare of faltering. There, thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. There's the snare of fear. The fear of man brings a snare, it says in Proverbs 29, 25. If we fear God, we don't have to fear anyone else. And of course, there's the snare of evil companionship. They shall be snares and traps to you. It says in Joshua chapter 23, verse 13. We all know that evil companions corrupt morals. They're going to drag you down. And so all of a sudden we begin to understand that there's a lot of things that can hold us back when we substitute the things of God or when we substitute right relationship with God or the fellowship of God. And so sin is like the stench of smoke that clings to your clothes. You see, sin, once you are in it, it begins to sort of like a cloud take over. And, and I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a situation where maybe you grew up in a home where your mother and your father smoked, or maybe you smoked. And, and all of a sudden, the smoke would fill a particular room and, and I, whatever your relationship is to the smoke, and, 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 and all of a sudden, you, you decided that that wasn't going to be a part of your life, but you can smell it. It, it. it clings to your clothing. It clings to you. And that's what sin does. It, it clings to you. It, it hampers you. Ryle said, sin forsaken is probably the best evidence of sin forgiven. He also said, the very animals whose smell is most offensive to us have no idea that they are offensive and are not offensive to one another. And man, fallen man, has just no idea what a vile thing sin is in the sight of God. Sin is like hygiene to a junior high schooler. For some reason, they can't smell it. Everybody else can smell it, but nobody else can smell it. And so it becomes that way with sin. It, it sort of permeates and perverts. And it holds you back. Sin wouldn't be so attractive if the wages were paid immediately. But the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Thomas Manton said, first we practice sin, then we defend sin, then we boast of sin. And so the word endurance is probably the key word in the chapter. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so evilly ensnare, easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance in verse 1. He who endured in verse 2. We see it again in verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility. You're going to see it again in verse 7. If you endure chastening. Again in verse 20. For they could not endure what was commanded. The reason why this reoccurring word appears in this reoccurring chapter is because of the exhortation that is given. Remember, people were looking to give up. Remember, he's talking to a group of people who are saying, I can't hold on and I want to let go. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, hold on, don't let go. By the way, the word endurance is that very familiar word, hupomone. I know, remember what I tell you? The, the way you remember that is it sounds like Italian spumone, but it's not spumone, it's hupomone. And it means to bear under pressure. It means to stay staying. It means to bear under pressure or trial or to continue. It, it had, carries with it the idea of keep on keeping on. 
The metaphor of the race seems to include this idea that you're getting ready to run and you're going to run a very far distance. And if you're a long distance runner, then you're going to be able to relate to that. If you're not a long distance runner, the way I would encourage you to think about it is think of a lot of short races all in a row, all in a row. Then it becomes a long race. The cloud of witnesses can function either as the crowd watching the, the race. But again, I think that these specific witnesses seem to include the faithful of chapter 11 who've already run the race and can testify that God is real. And remember what we already learned in chapter 11, that these people believed God. They believed the promise of God. They believed that there was going to be a Messiah. They believed that there was going to be a promised land. These are the ones who have already run the race. They can testify that what God says is true and that God is faithful. And again, we might think of these as the faithful heroes of the past who are watching those who are running in the present. They're watching for the same honors. And the picture becomes almost like a picture of if you've ever watched the Olympic Games, imagine you're watching the Olympic Games with an Olympian. Imagine you're watching the Olympic Games and you're looking at a particular event, whether it's the whether it's the marathon or whether it's the mile or whatever it happens to be, and you happen to be with the last gold medalists from the last four Olympics, and all of these Olympians are watching with bated breath as a new crop of runners or a new crop of athletes come, and they watch, and they're, they're, they're doing a number of different things. They're thinking about their own race. They're thinking about all that they did in order to compete in that race. And clearly these people would have been familiar with competition and racing. And the saints of old serve as a kind of inspiration. And I think that that's part of the point that this writer is making. The heroes in chapter 11 have run the race. They've endured. The participants are now spectators. And the witnesses that they're witnessing are the people who are running at this very moment. And then they're keenly interested in on how well you're going to do. And I, you probably don't think of yourself that way. For you, it's kind of creepy to think that Abel or Enoch or Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Moses is watching from heaven going, okay, all right, let's see how he's going to do. Let's see what she's going to do. Let's see what he's going to do. Because we don't think of it that way. We don't think of the saints watching us and to see how we're going to do. We think of our grandmother watching us in the shower and we're thinking, this is creepy. So theologically, are dead people watching us in this life? Probably not. But in a very real sense, we have access to the past and we've watched the race that they've run. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that there will come a time when your story will be ever bit as known as everybody else's story. You'll go to heaven and people will say, tell me about the race. Tell me about how you ran. These saints stood fast in times of trial and testing and temptation and op opposition. Did they give in to the temptation? By the way, anyone who's familiar with the Old Testament writings and the Old Testament heroes who are mentioned in chapter 11, did they live a perfect life? No. Did they fall from time to time? But did they fall all the time and forever? That's the right answer. Never for long, and certainly not forever. They may have experienced sin for a season, but it wasn't sin as a lifestyle. It wasn't sin as a way of life. Pain, yes. Suffering, yes. Temptation, yes. Failure, yes. But they endured in faith. 
These Christians were going through a time of testing. That's what we saw in chapter 10, verse 32. These Christians were tempted to give up. That's what we see in verse 3. No one had yet been called to die for Christ. That's what we see in verse 4. There's pain, there's suffering, there's difficulty. And so the writer is going to give them three encouragements that are going to keep them going and growing. He's going to give them the example of Jesus in verses 2 and 4. He's going to give them the assurance of God's love in verses 5 through 13. And then he's going to show the power of God's grace in verses 14 through 29. And so the whole chapter is going to explode. And so he says we have a spiritual model. Look what it says in verses 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endures the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer sees Jesus as the author of our faith. Who created Christianity? Jesus. Can you have Christianity without Christ? Can you have Buddhism without Buddha? Actually, yeah. Can you have Hinduism without Krishna? Are there lots of religions that the religion isn't really, really dependent on the founder of the religion? There are some. Jesus is the author of our faith. And since he's the author of our faith, he's worthy of of imitation and inspiration. And so when he says looking unto Jesus, the Lord Jesus is the supreme example of what it means to run the race. Remember what we've already learned in chapter 11. He's talked about Abel and Enoch and Noah. He's talked about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. He's talked about Joshua and Israel. He's talked about Rahab. He's talked about the prophets. But now when we come to chapter 12, is there a greater example? Is there a better example than Jesus himself? He's the supreme example. And the word, that expression, looking unto Jesus, it can mean a couple of things. It can mean that you fix your eyes on him. But I'm going to suggest to you that it isn't just the physical vision that you have with your eyeballs in your head. It's a, it's, it's a spiritual vision, but it's also a mental capacity that you fix your eyes on Jesus and you fix your mind on Jesus. Why? Why, why would he ask you to do that? Why would he say, look at Jesus, fix your eyes on him? Fix your mind on him. Why would he do that? I'm going to suggest to you first and foremost, the reason why he would ask you to do that is, is I want you to think of the obvious. Jesus has already run the race. Jesus knows exactly how to run the race. He's the author of the faith. He's perfected and completed the race. He's the perfect picture of obedience to his father, perfect dependence on the father, perfect righteousness towards the father. Everything that you need to do, he's already done. We can say it almost euphemistically and almost tritely, superficially. You know, some people wear the little wristband that says, what would Jesus do? But they don't really think it through. They see WWJD and they go, does that stand for who wants Jack Daniels? No, that's not what it's there to remind you of. And so the whole point becomes looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Just very quickly, we consider him, it says in verse 3. And I'm going to come back in just a moment, but the reason why I just skip forward, we consider him, that is, we consider how he acted. We consider what he did. We consider what he does. Jesus is the finisher. The, the word in the original language is only found here in the Greek text. It comes from a verb which literally means to bring to an ultimate end or a final consummation. We look to Jesus, which means in part 
that in order to look at Jesus or look to Jesus, we have to look away from everything else. We have to look away from everything else that is encouraging our eyes or our minds to stray from that singular vision of what it means to be a Christian and run the race and live the life. We look to Jesus, which means we look away from ourself. We look away from the culture and the world because the runner, when he or she is running, is envisioning just one thing, and that's the end of the race, and that's the finish line. Have any of you ever ran in track? You, maybe you were a short distance runner or a long distance runner. Some of you, yeah. Some of you ran. When I was in high school, I ran track. I ran the 100 yard dash and, and the 220, and I was a part of the 440 relay team. In the 440, I didn't think about the finish line because I was the first leg and I had to think about the second person who was running in the race. But when I ran my own race, the thing that I thought about wasn't the person to the left of me or the right of me, I had to think about the finish line because that's why I was running that race, to come to that line. And so our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And by the way, that's the only way that you are going to be able to look away from a sinful world. Because everything is going to invite your attention. Satan is going to say, look. And the Holy Spirit's going to say, look away. But it isn't good enough that you just simply look away. You have to look to Jesus. But looking at Jesus means we look at what motivated Jesus. That's what the writer says in the next point. Looking at Jesus means we look at what motivated Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And what is that joy? Take a guess. What do you think that that joy might be? I think that there's a lot of good answers. I think that there's a lot of great possibilities. But I think that the most exciting possibility of what that joy might be is you. You are that joy. And what do I mean by that? We might put it another way. It's the glorious day of redemption. We could say the joy that was set before him, we could put it in generic terms and say it is that glorious day, it is the glorious day when sin is forgiven and sinners are forgiven and human beings are reconciled to God. The glorious day is the day of salvation. It's the day when we're united together. It's the day that when we're exalted with Christ. It's the day when sin disappears forever. This is the day when there's no more earth and there's no more heaven. This is the day when every saint in every dispensation are united forever in a constant praise of Jesus the King. It's the joy of redemption and then it's all that redemption brings. I think it might just be that. I think it also just might be what I said in the beginning. That in the microcosm, it's you. He saw you. You were the joy that was set before him. You were his finish line. And he's your finish line. Do you understand what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us? Jesus suffered in order to obtain a future reward. Does it shock you that you might be his reward? Because it shouldn't shock you that he is your reward. And so the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage you. He's trying to motivate you. He's trying to help you put your current circumstances in light of this 
incredible future. In one powerful and brief sentence, the writer tells us who our model is, Jesus. What he did, he dies on the cross. And why he did it for you. And where he is at this very moment in heaven. Paul will write about that in the book of Ephesians. When he pictures Jesus in the heavenlies, but then he pictures you there and he pictures me there because in the book of Ephesians, he's going to talk about being in Christ. You are in Christ. You are in Christ. You are in Christ. And where is Christ? Christ is in heaven. And if you are in Christ and if he's in heaven, Paul connects the dots and he says, if you are in him and he is in heaven, then you are in heaven. And so when the writer of Hebrews says he's seated at the right hand of the Father, it isn't just this clever theological thing that he's saying in order for you to be accurate concerning where, where it is that Jesus has gone and, and, and what he's doing. Jesus suffers in order to obtain a future reward and Jesus is the supreme example of discipline. He's the supreme example of discipline. I want you to think about it maybe a little differently. Did Jesus play by God's rules? Did Jesus do everything that the Father required? Did Jesus have certain rules for Adam? Remember Adam and Eve of the tree of the garden of evil, you shall not eat thereof because in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die there was there wasn't a whole lot of rules there was just one rule just one rule when jesus is born how many rules are there would you say 10 you would be wrong yeah would you say 100 you'd still be wrong would you say 500 you'd still be wrong would you say 613 then you would be right that's how many Mosaic laws there were. He has, to, he has to obey all of them. Does he disobey any of them? He plays by the rules. Jesus played by God's rules. The Lord says, Jesus, you're going to be born in a Jewish culture and a Jewish society. Jesus, you're going to do and keep the law and you're going to do all of this stuff. Jesus does exactly what his father requires. Jesus runs the race. Jesus dies on the cross. Jesus rises from the dead. Jesus ignores and despises the shame of the cross in order to finish in perfect obedience to his father. He does this voluntarily. He does this willingly. He becomes the supreme example then of receiving the reward of faith. He's exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. Believers witnessed his ascension into heaven. Stephen, when he was witnessing to the religious leaders and they took up rocks and they began to stone him, you'll remember that Jesus, Stephen sees a vision of Jesus standing in heaven. And so the writer of Hebrews says, for consider him who endured, there's that word again, such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The writer of Hebrews invites us, look, in verse three, consider him who endured such hostility. The word hostility is very, very interesting in the original language. Many of you are gonna know this word, it's anti-logia. You know what the word anti is, and you know what the word logia is. It literally, it means to speak against or to speak in opposition. It's interesting, the same word in Jude 11 is translated rebellion. Here, I think in the context, it's more likely hostility. Hostility. 
Opposition, I think the NIV translates this. And so the word consider means to carefully evaluate. It means to compare. It means to reckon or count up or weigh. And so we focus on Jesus. He goes, consider Jesus, compare with Jesus, reckon in relationship to Jesus, focus on Jesus, and we consider his sufferings, and then we compare them to ours. So what is the writer saying? Jesus is the supreme example of discipline. Jesus suffers in order to obtain a future reward. Jesus is the supreme example of suffering. Who are you? Who, who are you? Are you a widow? Are you an orphan? Are you a victim? Are you a prostitute? Are you a slave? Are you a sufferer? Who are you? Let's do the comparison just for a moment. Were you born to an unwed mother? You know what's interesting about this little list? Some of you are gonna be able to say, well, yeah. Were you born to an unwed mother? Were you born in a feeding trough? Were your parents poor? Did someone try to kill you as a child? Did you have to run for your life? Were you raised in a place worse than Nazareth? I know some of you are thinking, Commerce City, Nazareth. Commerce City, Nazareth. Okay, I'm going to concede you that one. Did your earthly father die early in your life? Did you have to support your mother, your brothers, and your sisters? Were you homeless? Were you hated and rejected by the religious establishment? Were you accused of being insane or even demon-possessed? Were you rejected by your own family? Were you betrayed by someone you loved? Were you rejected and forsaken by friends and family? Were you ever tried in a court and found innocent and still punished and then tortured? and then crucified. So why do we even do that? Why would we even do that? Why would we even compare? Do you know what the writer of Hebrews is saying? We do this. We do this so we won't give up. So we won't despair. In other words, we look at our life and we look at our circumstance and we evaluate it in light of Jesus' life and, and Jesus' circumstance and we have this wonderful privilege to say, I'm still in pretty good shape. I'm still doing pretty good. Whatever it is that you want to use, whatever word you want to use to describe my life or my circumstances or my pain or my suffering, it doesn't seem very much. The verbs translated, lest you become weary or and lest you become discouraged or lose heart. These were actual verbs that were used in the ancient world to describe a runner who ran and ran and ran. In, in modern running, sometimes a runner will run so long that they, that they use a word to describe it that, that he or she will hit the wall or something like that. You hit a wall. It's that place where exhaustion takes over. It's where your body begins to shut down. And endurance is what happens in the runner's mind. And he or she put one step in front of the other and they continue. Walter Ellicott wrote, Perseverance is not a long race. It's many short races, one after the other. And so when the writer of Hebrews says, lest you become weary, lest you become discouraged, I think the reason why he says that 
is because sometimes we are weary and we are discouraged. And what is it? What is it that wears on us? Let's ask that question just for a moment. Have you grown weary? Have you become discouraged? And what, what can bring discouragement? There's lots of stuff you could put on the list. I'll bet you're thinking of something right at this very moment. You might be thinking of illness, or you might be thinking of sickness. You might be thinking of poverty. You might be thinking of things that happen in your life. You might be think, thinking of death of family members. You might be thinking of any number of things. What are the things that can make you go, grow weary? What are the things that can, can make you discouraged? What, what are the things that, that might make you want to throw in the towel and say, I think I don't know that I can do this anymore? Paul told Timothy, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Paul reminded Timothy that he too was suffering, but their suffering served at least two purposes. He was suffering for Christ and he was suffering with Christ for the benefit of the church. So Paul in that same circumstance as he's talking to Timothy in the midst of the hardship and the suffering, he reminds him of what he is doing and why he is doing it and why it is important. Because if you're experiencing a setback, if you're experiencing some depression or some discouragement or some despair or some doubt, and you're wondering, well, okay, what is going on and why is all of this going and, and am I suffering? And am I, am I suffering for Christ's sake? And am I suffering for the benefit of, of the church? A soldier suffers for the benefit of his or her country and a soldier suffers for the benefit of, of your loved ones. Why is a soldier willing to go someplace and do something that he wouldn't normally do? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, Paul is writing this towards the end of his life where death is almost certain within moments after he writes this epistle. And he basically says, I'll do this for you, for your sake, for your benefit, to encourage you, to remind you, to give you all of the resources that are going to be necessary for you to run the race. Augustine wrote, who would wish for hardship and difficulty? You command us to endure these troubles, not to love them. No one loves what he endures, even though he may be glad to endure it. Augustine got it right. He, he, he says, God isn't calling you to love being unemployed, love being sick, love being in a situation where you're wondering about what's going on in your life, but rather to be glad, to endure it. Endurance seems like a lost virtue. It was the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau who wrote, quote, to endure is the first thing that a child ought to learn and that which he will have the most need to know, unquote. Endurance is a lost virtue. In our culture and society, one of the very first things that many, many people learn is to give up. Marriage isn't working. Give up. Boss is being mean to you. Give up. This is happening. Give up. That's happening. Give up. But the Bible says, go forward. Endure. Endure. 
And we're given a special reassurance. Look at verse 4. You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Here, I don't think it means being punched in the nose and you've got a nosebleed. I don't think it means even maybe having a cut on your back. I think what he's talking about is being dead. I think he's talking about martyrdom. Because if they had suffered to martyrdom, they wouldn't be reading the text. What does it really mean? I think it means that they've suffered, they've experienced unrelenting persecution, but these particular people that he is addressed have not yet really died striving against sin. And so he's giving them reassurances. When we ask the question, how bad could it get? I think some of you could offer answers, couldn't you? For many people in Syria, it's really bad right now. In North Korea, it's very, very bad. When people are getting their head chopped off in North Africa, that's bad. Christians all over the world are experiencing unrelenting persecution. The writer of Hebrews says, resist sin. We're to resist the besetting sin. We're to resist those things that trip us up, tear us down, smother us, entangle us. We're to resist. So I'm going to suggest to you, he's, he's suggesting that there's not that you just simply resist sin generically, although, although I think that this is part of what's being said. I think that there's two sins that the writer has in mind, most certainly. The first is the besetting sin. It's the sin that you hold on to. It's the sin that always seems to trip you up. It's the, the sin that always kind of discourages you, that you don't seem to be able to get the victory over. He, he's talking about resisting that that sin, but I think he's also talking about resisting the most difficult sin of all. And I think that what he's talking about is the temptation and then the sin to give up, to walk away. To abandon the gospel, to turn your back on Jesus, to turn your back on the gospel. G.K. Chesterton wrote, Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would, number one, be completely fearless, number two, that they would be absurdly happy, and number three, that they would be in constant trouble. And he was exactly right. Jesus resisted temptation. And that's the picture of Jesus. In verse 4, it says, You've not resisted to bloodshed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus resists temptation to give up. When he's faced with the temptations by Satan, when he is faced with Calvary's cross, Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, do you not know that those who run the race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown, he writes. Paul in Corinthians says he's interested in a reward. It's an eternal reward. And I think that part of the context that Paul is making is athletes give up their rights to win a temporary crown. Christians lay aside privileges and Christians lay aside conveniences. But the privileges that we lay aside and the conveniences that we lay aside, it isn't to get something that's temporary. It's to get something that's eternal. Justin Martyr wrote, you can kill us, but you can't hurt us. The Bible says, submit to God. 
Resist the devil. He will flee. But sin will sometimes disguise itself as something good. You know, sin, in order to be effective, it has to disguise itself as something good and then even connect itself to something that seems good. Sin is like a virus that will connect to the healthy tissue and then wind up killing that tissue. And so how do we resist sin? When it says in verse four, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed. How do you resist? You know, before I became a Christian, the issue wasn't whether or not I was going to give in. The issue is, when am I going to give in? And do I have a reasonable expectation that I'm not going to be caught or arrested? We laugh, but that's the way the unbeliever thinks. But as a Christian, as a Christian, it's something entirely different. The way that we resist is we learn and we live God's word. Psalm 119, verse 11, John 15, 7. The way to resist sin isn't just simply to memorize the Bible, but it's to live the Bible. You'll remember that when Jesus resists Satan, what does he do? He resists him with the word of God. Someone has said the Bible will keep one from sinning or sin will keep one from the Bible. So how do we resist sin? I'm going to suggest to you that we know the Bible, we live the Bible, but also there's the intercession of the Son of Man or the Son of God in Luke chapter 22, verse 32, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Zechariah chapter 4, John chapter 7. In other words, resisting sin includes knowing God's word, living God's word. It includes Allowing Jesus to do the work of intercession as your high priest and the ministry of the Holy Spirit inside of you. V. Raymond Edmund would constantly say, it's always too soon to quit. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is doing as well. Don't give up. Don't quit. Running the race includes inspiration in verse 1, discipline in verse 1, the example of Jesus in verse 2. We keep our eyes and our minds on Jesus in verse 3. And we resist temptation in verse 4. And we run. And we run. Jesus is the starting line. And in a very real sense, Jesus is the finish line. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for your love. Lord, we run our race. Lord, we know that you require perfection. But we also know that there's only one place where perfection can be found. And then that's in the life of Jesus, in the love of Jesus, in the heart of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, in the crucifixion of Jesus, and in the resurrection of Jesus. And Heavenly Father, since you require perfection, and perfection can only be found in Christ then the only way we're going to be able to satisfy you is that if we're in Christ. And that's the amazing, amazing good news that because we love Jesus, because we've turned from our sin and because we've trusted Jesus, we can in confidence proclaim that we're in Christ and we can run the race finish the race. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.